I am delighted to introduce my friend and uh, my associate, uh, Carrie M. Karchner. I think, Carrie, it's been 15 years now since uh, you, you came to campus to speak a long, long time ago when you were at the Naval Postgraduate School. My goodness. <clears throat> old friend. Emphasis on the old. Huh? <laughs> Well, Karim Karchner has over 20 years of experience in the field of national security affairs, with an emphasis on nuclear weapons policy and arms control. Following the completion of his current assignment, Karchner will resume his prior duties at the U.S. Department of State, where he was senior advisor for missile defense policy in the Bureau of Arms Control. He has served previously as senior representative of the U.S. Department of State to the U.S. component of the Standing Consultative Commission for the ABM Treaty in Geneva, Switzerland, in the Office of Strategic and Theater Missile Defense in the Bureau of Arms Control, and as a senior advisor to Bureau and Department leadership regarding deterrence and strategic arms control issues. In May 2003, he was co-chair of a conference sponsored by the Kennedy Center, for Latter-day Saint National Security Professionals held in Washington, D.C. at the Barlow Center. From 1986 to 1990, Karchner worked as an assistant professor in the Department of National Security Affairs at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California, where he taught courses on nuclear strategy and targeting, arms control, international relations, U.S.-Soviet relations, and NATO security. Karchner is the recipient of the first annual Secretary of State's Award for Public Outreach. What a great honor. A meritorious honor award in 1999 and a Hubert H. Humphrey Arms Control Fellowship in 1989. He is the author or co-author of several books as well as a contributor to other journals and edited collections. Karchner received his bachelor's degree in international relations from BYU. See, UIR majors, there's a good future ahead of you and master's and doctoral degrees both in IR with emphases in foreign policy analysis and strategic studies from the University of Southern California. Right now, um, Dr. Karchner is the Foreign Affairs Advisor to the Advanced System and Concepts Office of the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, where he um, has been hired to provoke them with new ideas about such things as the future of nuclear weapons. So let's give a nice introduction, nice welcome to Kerry Karchner. As uh, Valerie mentioned, for the last four or five years, I've been a spokesman for the Department of State on missile defense policy. And that, that wasn't quite controversial enough for me, so I've decided to branch out into new topics. And so this is an area that my new responsibilities in the Office of the uh, Advanced Systems and Concepts Office, uh, a new responsibility that I have in that office is to deal with strategic issues and to think out five to ten years into the future about our national security and what kinds of threats we might face and what we need to be doing now to face those threats. So let me uh, proceed with, let me mention a few caveats to begin with. I realize that this issue evokes uh, strong emotions. It's a very complex issue, and we will only have time today to touch briefly on just a few of the aspects of it. But my purpose is to explain the terms of the debate over the policies and doctrines that shape our national approach to nuclear deterrence. And I'm, I'm not going to be getting into the details of new weapon designs or the technical aspects of of uh, the weapons themselves. I'm going to be talking more about the policies and the concepts that are shaping our thinking in Washington about what the roles and missions are for nuclear forces, if there is a role or a mission for those. And we'll get into that. Um, and it's this focus on the policies and concepts where ASCO comes in. ASCO is the Advanced Systems and Concepts Office, and let me tell you a little bit more about that office. 
because I'm very pleased to have been recruited to come over there from the State Department and spend one or two years there on their staff. It's a small think tank in the Department of Defense devoted exclusively to thinking through issues related to weapons of mass destruction, including nuclear issues. Um, of course, the views that I express here are those of uh, are my own and should not necessarily be construed as representing uh, uh, those of DTRA, DOD, or the U.S. government. Or as I might say to this particular audience, this is a, a briefing that is based strictly on the philosophies of men, and there's not even any mingled scripture in, in here. So with that, let's... I'm just going to go over the current political context, describe some of the conditions that are contributing to our rethinking of uh, about the role of nuclear weapons in U.S. security policy, and then I'll describe current official policy as far as it goes on this issue. And then I'll talk about the kinds of questions and dilemmas faced by current policymakers on this and that I am now having a role in helping shape. And I will conclude with some comments about ASCO's contribution, including some current projects, and I hope to leave some time at the end for your questions and hopefully answer to some of those. These are the factors that are leading to rethinking the roles and missions of nuclear forces in current U.S. policy. The first one is, of course, we face an entirely different threat environment than we faced during the Cold War. Many associate our requirement for nuclear weapons with deterring the old Soviet threat and there is, I think, a legitimate question now about the relevance of nuclear weapons in the current environment, and I'll get into that in a moment. We are not sure how to deter some of the new threats. Leaders of rogue states may be inclined to take more risks. They may not always seem rational to us. Communication links may not always be clear and open. We may not even understand how to deter cultures that now we, are, we now have to deal with. The, for example, the messages that we send to them may be completely misinterpreted. We have, we have done a study where there was evidence that the signals that we were communicating to India and Pakistan during the Cargill crisis were completely misconstrued by the players, the leaders in, in Pakistan and, and uh, India, thinking that we wanted to ramp up the crisis and they, that's how they interpreted it. We were trying to bring things under control. So there's challenges to deterrence and that's causing us to rethink deterrence. There's less political support for new nuclear weapon initiatives. There's even for maintaining current ones. Arms control is considered a major success by most and many believe that because of the success in arms control we've now essentially resolved the nuclear weapons problem we don't have to think about it anymore um, then there's a very interesting viewpoint that says that America's conventional superiority means we don't need the backup of a nuclear deterrent anymore because we can do everything we need to with a conventional, with our conventional forces. And uh, that's a very interesting point of view. International legal constraints, and then finally, uh, our existing nuclear weapons infrastructure is aging. It's becoming more and more expensive to maintain. And those are also, those kinds of things are also leading to our rethinking the whole role of, of nuclear weapons in international security. So that's the context for thinking about this. In a speech at National Defense University in May 2001, <laughs> President Bush set the tone for this administration's consideration of nuclear weapon issues. 
He committed the United States to reducing its nuclear forces to the lowest possible number based on two considerations. Those were first our national security needs, what was consistent with our national security needs, and secondly, though, it was our obligations to our allies. Now, exactly what is consistent with our national security needs is not entirely clear, although we have some preliminary answers. But what about our obligations to allies? That is not often taken into account when projecting or discussing or analyzing our nuclear requirements, and I'll talk some more about that. It turns out that our allies, uh, some of our allies and friends, depend on us to provide an extended deterrence guarantee, and that security guarantee is what keeps them from developing their own nuclear weapons. So there's actually a non-proliferation component to our extended deterrence guarantees. Some of us are concerned that if our extended deterrence guarantee lacks credibility or is undermined for some reason, certain allies and friends may decide that they need to pursue their own independent nuclear weapons policy, and we think that would be destabilizing and would complicate regional security situations. So, um, I might mention here that in my t frequent talks with uh, leaders overseas, they recognize that the United States has unique global responsibilities that are not shared with other countries. And therefore, they understand, in some respects, the requirements that we have for a nuclear arsenal. They may disagree with us on the size of it or some other aspects, but, but they have repeatedly ratified the, the necessity of maintaining that deterrent. There, there is a virtual consensus among national security analysts that nuclear weapons did contribute to our national security during the Cold War. Now, there are contrary views, but this is the, the, the virtual consensus. The question arises, though, are nuclear weapons still needed? And that's the debate we're going to talk about. There's two preliminary answers to that. The first one is, yes, they are still needed to deter war between major powers and to underwrite the security commitments to regional allies. The other view is, no, we don't need them. They are inherently stabilizing and they undermine our nonproliferation objectives. And what the, the, those that hold that view, what they mean by that is, <laughs> how can we tell other countries that they can't have nuclear weapons if we insist on maintaining the right to have them? And that's a very interesting question, and I'll try to answer that. <coughs> if your answer to this question is yes, then you have to ask yourself a series of other questions. How many? What types? What employment doctrine? Um, can you fulfill your security requirements with the existing weapons that you have? Or do you need new types? Do you need to refurbish the ones you've got? There's a whole series of questions like that, and I'm going to divide those questions into three categories, these three categories. In my study of strategic issues, I find that virtually every question I've seen or, or raised falls into one of these three categories. It's either a question about what deters, or it's a question of how much is enough, which is the quantitative answer. What, what, how many, how are they postured, what's their composition? Um, questions about alert rates fall into this category. And the third type of questions is, what if deterrence fails? And this has always been the great unthinkable question. What, 
what happens if you actually have to use these weapons? Now, we don't like to think about that because we like to think the main reason for their existence is to provide a deterrent if strong enough and if flexible and effective enough that they never have to be used. But your, the usability of the weapons is an important part of their deterrent value. So let's go through each of those questions and I'll explain what the state of the current debate is on each of those questions. This is the Cold War answer to these three questions. What deters? The answer was basically the threat of massive punitive retaliation. How much is enough? The answer was thousands and thousands of, of weapons of all sizes and yields based on a wide variety of delivery platforms. And the objective was to deter a major war in Europe, uh, a conventional attack through, across the folded gap by the Warsaw Pact to deter a surprise attack, control escalation, contain the Soviet Empire. Robert McNamara, well, let me back up. Sometimes when I get into debates with, with my associates on this question of how much is enough, they will say, we can't quantify that. We can't come up with a number, and I'll say, Robert McNamara came up with a number, and then we'll debate the validity of that number, which it's pretty easy to tear that number apart, but he came up with a number, okay? And that number had a very significant influence on the forces that we eventually acquired during the Cold War. And then finally, during the Cold War, this question, what if deterrence fails? There was not a whole lot of discussion about it, but the debate broke down into two camps on that. One was the, if deterrence fails, you need to be prepared to conduct and win a nuclear war. And on the other side was this uh, camp whose mantra was nuclear war cannot be won, it must never be fought. Therefore, if you get into a, a conflict and deterrence fails, your, your goal has to be to limit damage and terminate the conflict as soon as possible. So those were the Cold War answers. The answers to these questions are going to be different now than they were, than the ones that we came up with during the Cold War. And you know, 25 years after they were first popular, you know, the monkeys had another big hit. Did you know that, Valerie? That was a pop culture question. Uh, and the name of their hit was, that was then, this is now. That's my theme for this part of this brief the rest of the group. Okay, these questions have not been entirely ignored in Washington. In fact, in 2001, the Defense Department issued something called the Quadrennial Defense Review, issued in September 2001. And what's interesting about this document is it said deterrence is no longer the sole purpose of our forces. Our forces need to do a variety of things. This is what they need to do. They need to assure allies and friends of our security guarantees. They need to dissuade adversaries from undertaking programs or operations that could threaten U.S. interests. This, this is the non-proliferation or counter-proliferation objective. Um, they, deterrence still is part of the thing, but now it's only one of four objectives. And finally, if all these others fail, our forces must be capable of defeating any adversary. Now, the Quadrennial Defense Review is, is talking about our conventional forces and our nuclear forces. So they have to meet the, these criteria. Just a few months later, the administration published something called the Nuclear Posture Review, or NPR. And it reiterated all the conclusions of the QDR, and it said nuclear weapons need to contribute to those four objectives, assurance, dissuasion, deterrence, and defeat. But it also said that 
the U.S. no longer faces a single threat, and it's unclear what the threat environment in the future will be. It said that nuclear weapons should be considered just one component of the overall U.S. military force structure, and it recognized a great deal of uncertainty with respect to the future. In fact, I'll tell you a little something interesting about the NPR, um, because I know personally most of the authors. This NPR was the first one not to give a number for what our force structure should be, the nuclear forces should be. There is no numbers in this. Okay, each successive, each previous administration had issued a similar document, and it had given a number. It said, we need this many. Now, normally that number was determined or related to our arms control objectives, but no numbers in this. And according to the authors of this report, uh, as to the extent they've shared this with me, that was deliberate. Well, first of all, they couldn't come up with a number. They said there's just too many unknowns, too many uncertainties. And they said this NPR was supposed to be the beginning of a dialogue, a debate on these issues. So it just wanted to shift the direction of the debate into the new Cold, post-Cold War environment. And it has been very effective in doing that. Uh, by the way, I'm a contributing author to a book that's going to be published this year on implementing the NPR. My chapter is on the missile defense aspects of, of the NPR. But there's been a series of conferences on it, and the Defense Department is supposed to be developing an updated uh, look at implementing the NPR. Here's a little bit more about the NPR. It created the concept of a new triad. And what's interesting about this new triad is that nuclear weapons are just one small part of it. It has three legs, the nuclear, non-nuclear offensive strike leg, which is where the nuclear weapons come into it, an active and passive defense leg, that's the missile defense part, and then something that they call a responsive defense industrial infrastructure. And this, the overall conclusions or overall result of this was, first of all, to support reductions to 1,700 to 2,200 deployed nuclear weapons under the Moscow Treaty, but it also laid the basis for reducing our reliance on nuclear weapons as part of our national security. But it left a series of open questions. These are the open questions that now that have been raised by the NPR. What do we need to assure, dissuade, deter, or defeat? And who is it that we need to assure, dissuade, deter, or defeat? Is it other major powers? Is it rogue states? Is it what we call, or what some people call, near peers? And by that they mean China. Is it uh, a resurgent Russia? Is it non-state actors? We, we are devoting increasing attention to the issue of non-state actors, how you deter them, what makes them tick, stuff like that. And there's a very interesting question about how, how do nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrents relate to non-state actors? We haven't been able to answer that question yet. It's not clear that they do relate. What if we, what is it that we want to assure, dissuade, deter, defeat? And there's two things. Is it, is it an attack on the U.S., its forces deployed abroad, or its allies using weapons of mass destruction? Or is it that we want to assure, dissuade, deter the proliferation of those weapons of mass destruction? And then more specifically, how do nuclear weapons, or how could or how should they contribute to those goals with respect to those actors? Those are the questions that we are answering now. If any of you have answers to those questions, we have multi-million dollar contracts waiting for you in the Defense Department.
block grants to academic institutions that can answer those questions. Okay, the next series of questions is, this is a mis mistake the way this is phrased. This should say, how little is enough? That is the, the more appropriate question now in this post-Cold War. Well, let me show you what we have now. This, we've got 500 Minuteman 3s that used to carry three warheads and now only carry one. We have 50 Peacekeeper missiles that carry 10 warheads each. They are being decommissioned. Does anybody know where they are going to store all the Peacekeeper missile stages, all of them, when they're decommissioned? Does anybody know where they're going to be stored? Hill? Air Force Base. Is that is that what you were going to say? No, Yucca Mountain is for nuclear reactor waste and waste products from the infrastructure, not the missiles. Hill Air Force Base. Utah will be the home of the largest group of decommissioned missiles. And those are just the stages, not the warheads. We have 192 Trident 1 missiles um, and 240 Trident 2s. We have 94 B-52s and 21 B-2s. Now, well, a few things that aren't on there are the B-1s. The B-1s have all been converted to conventional roles, so they don't even count anymore as a nuclear carrier. And we have approximately 800 tactical nuclear weapons in storage. Now, what's interesting about these numbers, a couple of things. One is, this strategic warhead number is about 50% lower than it was just 12 years ago. So in 12 years, it's come down by 50%. And this tactical warhead number is about 90% lower than it was. It's just 10% of what it was 12 years ago. The other interesting thing about this, though, is these weapons were designed for the Cold War. They're too big, they're too slow, they're inflexible, and they are not well suited to the kinds of missions that we have now. Now, here's another thing you have to keep in mind when you work through these kind of issues, and that is you can't consider these questions in a vacuum as they relate strictly to the United States. You have to look at what other nuclear arsenals exist out there. This chart shows the approximations of other existing and suspected national nuclear forces. Now, in most cases, we don't view these as <laughs> threats, so they're not like planning criteria for what we need and so forth. But in some cases, they could be viewed as threats. And the question then is, are is a U.S. nuclear deterrent the answer to these, or is there some other answer? The overall effect of our new policies and the direction this debate is going in is to reduce our reliance on nuclear weapons. The new policy goals recognize the role that conventional weapons can play. We had this new triad that I talked about. The Moscow Treaty will further reduce the numbers of deployed strategic nuclear weapons by another 50 percent over the next 10 years. Um, and those things acting together are significantly reducing the, the role of nuclear weapons in our national security posture. This is, this is just a little more about the, the direction that these, this trend line is, and I projected out to the Moscow Treaty here. START II would have taken effect at some point in there, but it has been superseded by the Moscow Treaty. And I don't rule out the possibility that the Moscow Treaty could be superseded by another treaty. But those are the trend lines in terms of deployed strategic nuclear warheads. Okay, the last set of questions. 
This has always been difficult to address because of the unknowns and because of the stigma of avoiding thinking about the unthinkable, but this set of questions has to be addressed because deterrence depends significantly on making sure that any potential opponent knows you are willing to use your, your, your deterrent threat and to carry out your deterrent threat if that threat is to have any deterrent value. So if you have forces that cannot be used, your own willingness to use them will lack credibility. Here's another dilemma that we've dealt with, and that is, um, I know about 10 years ago, a, a number of religious groups came out with statements on the morality of nuclear weapons, and the Catholic Church in particular came out with a pastoral letter that said it is, it is immoral to even think about using them. Well, that undermines deterrence. And those experts involved in that exercise recognize that dilemma. We've, we've talked about it. We've had some interesting conversations about how they reconcile the dilemma of recognizing that you need the deterrent for national security, but it's immoral to, to ever use that. Well, there are two views about this question then, um, what if deterrence fails, and I've rephrased it as, are nuclear weapons still relevant? This is the con view, there, and those who have this view believe there are no significant threats. Um, U.S. conventional superiority provides a sufficient deterrent. There are few targets that cannot be held at risk by conventional weapons. And pursuing the upkeep or modernization or, re or refurbishment of U.S. nuclear weapons undermines our nonproliferation goals. Then on the other side of this question, there are those who believe that some <laughs> nuclear threats still exist, others could arise in the future, and that it is precisely because of our conventional supremacy that others may feel a need to acquire a, a, an asymmetrical capability in the form of weapons of mass destruction. Those who hold this view believe that there are some targets that can only be held at risk by nuclear weapons. And let me translate this. HDBT is an increasingly common acronym now in Washington, hard and deeply buried targets. And those come in uh, basically two <coughs> varieties. They are hard and deeply buried targets related to nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons of mass destruction, storage, production, facilities, whatever. And hard and deeply buried targets that contain command, control, and communication centers. This view also recognizes the importance of providing a nuclear extended deterrent guarantee to certain allies. Now, the agency that I am assigned to right now, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, has an advisory committee called the Threat Reduction Advisory Committee, or TRAC. And it just recently completed and issued a report on the transformation of U.S. nuclear weapons. And I was involved in the, in the final process of completing that report and arranging for its releasability. But among its conclusions, it found that the United States will require nuclear forces in the future, and it had these kinds of conclusions. Weapons the adversary sees as usable for credibility. Weapons capable of achieving U.S. war aims at acceptable cost a latent capacity for future major power strategic competition. What that means is a reserve that can be reactivated. An overwhelming strategic posture vis-a-vis -vis rogue states. The, here's that reassurance mission or assurance mission. A balanced capability and then they recognize the importance of having the, the intelligence necessary uh, to support this, and then they re raised concerns about the personnel, that is, the number of people in the nuclear weapons infrastructure is dwindling and the expertise is 
fading away. These are some of ASCO's specific contributions to answering these questions. ASCO is actively involved in seeking answers to the questions I've just raised as they relate to conceptual and doctrinal roles for nuclear weapons in the future. And these are some of the studies that ASCO has undertaken. We've done a strategic work security workshop at uh, STRATCOM in Omaha, Nebraska with the military folks to talk about how you operationalize the goals of assurance, dissuasion, and deterrence. Um, I organized and arranged for the Institute of National Security Studies at the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs to host a workshop on crossing the threshold of nuclear conflict in the 21st century, and we we're pleased to have Professor Hudson participate in that. Uh, I helped organize a workshop on defining what dissuasion means and how you operationalize that. We held that at the Naval Postgraduate School in September. Uh, I am in the process now of completing our study on new escalation dynamics, which looks at how does an escalation process look different now than it would have during the Cold War when we expected a surprise attack out of the blue with thousands of weapons. How would it look different now? And then I am in the process right now of establishing a new study effort that's going to look at all, all of these kinds of questions in the future. And I have designed a very unique approach to answering uh, to a answering these questions that hopefully will yield a, an intriguing study output. So in, to summarize, you know, I've raised more questions than I've answered, and that is where we are now. We're, in this, we're struggling to answer these questions, to adapt current policy and what we call legacy nuclear forces to new threats new opportunities, new requirements. The trend is toward reducing reliance on nuclear weapons and reducing the numbers of weapons. Nevertheless, it is still important to maintain a safe, secure, and reliable deterrent force. And this office that I'm currently assigned to, ASCO, is in the forefront of developing new WMD doctrinal concepts and exploring their application in U.S. policy. Uh, I hope that gives you a sense of how we're framing the debate, what the terms of the debate are, and what the direction of this debate is. And I'd be happy now to take some questions. We have a few moments. Yes, sir. You talk a lot about in ensuring our, assuring our allies that we have the capability to protect them still. Um, since the, the, uh, sorry, since the United States government stopped doing underground testing, it's increasingly harder for um, support facilities to, to manufacture and upkeep the nuclear weapons and for the government to assure that those weapons work, that the older they get. What other alternatives are there to underground testing to assure the functionality of current weapon um, arsenals? The question is, how do we maintain the arsenals and maintain in order to assure their effectiveness for the extended deterrence mission? Is that your question? Yeah, how do you do that without underground the, that is a big question, and the Department of Energy has uh, developed an, over the last 10 years a nuclear stockpile stewardship program. The budget for that program is $5 billion a year, and it's based on supercomputers and, and modeling, and uh, an enormous amount of effort is going into that. And there's a debate, though, within that community about how accurate, how effective, how realistic that that computer analysis and simulation is as a substitute for actual testing. But the Department of Energy has certified to Congress each year for the last 10 years that that program is working. So that's the Department of Energy's answer to that question. Let's see. Yes, sir.
there are two views on proliferation over the next 10 years. One is the optimistic view and one is the pessimistic view. And we are developing now new tools to respond to those kinds of proliferation issues. You know, Libya is a fascinating example. What, what has Libya done over the past year? That's right. The, the technical phrase we use is Libya has chosen the full Monty option. That's <laughs> chosen to do the full Monty, the complete disarmament. And it is an absolutely fascinating story. The, uh, the officials that were involved in the secret negotiations with Libya are now beginning to tell the story of, of that. And it's absolutely fascinating. Bob Joseph gave a fascinating talk in November in London <coughs> where he gave a personal account of meeting with the Libyans and how that all unfolded. And, and this whole story of Libya making a decision to abandon its weapons of mass destruction programs is a tribute to the success of our current nonproliferation policy. At least most of us believe that it is a, a successful example and a fascinating example. So we, we are taking steps. One of the most important is called the Proliferation Security Initiative. Have you heard anything about PSI? That is a collaboration among nations to uh, develop the international legal framework and the operational capability to interdict ships on the high seas and aircraft that could be transporting illicit weapons of mass destruction from North Korea to other countries. And we're, we've already be begun intercepting those kinds of things. And it was the interception of such a shipment that was one of the factors leading to Libya's decision. Yes, ma'am, please. Uh, you've explained the countries that uh, we consider a nuclear threat uh, could be there. Uh, would you explain Israel's role in uh, their nuclear program, how extensive it is, where it came from, and that you consider that a, a major threat to the Arab countries? The, the question of Israel and where its deterrent came from and what it has and everything is an absolutely fascinating issue. First of all, Israel officially denies that. Um, we, we, we don't fully accept this denial. Um, and it, it puts the United States in a very awkward position with respect to its nonproliferation objectives. However, there is a very intriguing argument that I'm not advocating this argument, but I'm very intrigued by it, and I'm still grappling with this issue. And it's, uh, it's, based, it, it's best reflected in a very interesting debate between two scholars, Scott Sagan and um, Kenneth Waltz. Scott Sagan argues that if the more countries that have nuclear weapons the more likely an accident is to happen, the more likely an escalation process gets out of control, the more likely a nuclear war starts. Kenneth Waltz argues that the more countries that have nuclear weapons, the less likely it is that they're going to get in a war because they're going to be much more careful about it. Now, some of the evidence that Kenneth Waltz cites is he, he says there has not been a major war between the Israelis and the Arab countries since 1974, which coincidentally, coincides with the suspected development of an Israeli nuclear force. So Kenneth Waltz says that Israel's acquisition of a nuclear deterrent and the way they've managed it has been hyper-stabilizing. <coughs> That's a very interesting argument. Now, but not everyone shares that argument or, or shares that conclusion. Others believe that it has been the basis for an, a, a determination on the part of Islamic countries to develop their own response to that. And there are no guarantees that they are going to be as ostensibly responsible, if we want to call the way Israel has managed it responsible, there's no guarantee they're going to be as, I'm not sure responsible is the right word of 
about it. But um, it's a very dangerous situation, and our policy is to discourage uh, proliferation of nuclear forces. So I'm not sure that was an entirely satisfactory answer to that question. Chairman, 